Hello everyone, welcome to the hottest day of the clown world so far in my part of the world. I am currently dying at 40 degrees Celsius and if anyone in the comments says, oh that's not that hot, I'm coming over there and boiling your arse in the sun. Because it is indeed boiling hot, I've decided that uh, we're going to do a good old fashioned 2014 to 2016 style reply video. Because they're low effort and very fun to do and that's the type of thing I need to do today. So we're going to a channel that's an old favourite of mine, Navara Media, which has Ash Sarkar as one of the editors. And they decided to make a rather small video called Douglas Murray Goes Full Fash Speaking to Dave Rubin. With a thumbnail, choosing a rather unflattering image of Douglas Murray, I have to say. I have a quote just saying that he's done being polite, and I'm completely on board with him. So I really want to see how Navara Media react to their political enemies finally saying that enough is enough. Douglas Murray is an associate editor at The Spectator and regularly appears on high-profile shows such as Question Time. Murray has long been a loud voice opposing immigration to Britain, especially by Muslims, and in a recent interview with Dave Rubin, his far-right views were taken to their logical, hateful conclusion. Well, this is the Navarra media, so they're going to have to keep this narrative going that basically if you're against immigrants, you're clearly only hateful, and it's not out of empathy for people who have to live in areas where immigration has been a massive problem. It can't possibly be that people like Murray and myself are on the side of wanting Britain to be a stable country with a homogenous culture that when immigrants do come over they do actually integrate into the culture rather than having to make massive changes to the culture and laws so that we can end up having stories come out years and decades after mass migration is hit that basically seem to have turned entire towns into rape centres. Let's take a look. Well, here's what I think. I think we've been being polite. And I'm done with it, totally done with it. Um, all of what I describe in this book is only going on because of, uh, we happen to live in highly tolerant societies. So again, Navarra Media are basically not giving the full context here, which is fine. Because I'm just saying, if this was me replying to a leftist in an interview, I'd make sure you know exactly what they're talking about here. And don't get me wrong, when I am introducing leftists sometimes, I will basically call them stupid, typical leftist, ignorant, all these things. But when I bring up a clip like this, I will let you know things that I'm about to let you know about Douglas Murray here. In that he is talking about his new book with Dave Rubin, The War on the West, which is a book I've not yet read, but do plan to read. And the current topic that they are talking about is basically political answers to the leftist intrusions into all our electorate, all our institutions, and all our politics and political institutions. And as you can see, he thinks so far that the problem has been that we are far too polite, in that we tolerate quite a bit of political leniency here, but now they have clearly gone too far and they are just not respectful to the opposition. So why should the opposition be respectful back? Uh, so I give, I give a set of what it would look like if we stopped being tolerant. Um, I mean, here are a couple of standoffs I would do. Uh, I feel this very strongly. If, if you uh, don't respect my ancestors, I see no reason to respect yours. See, that is a very reasonable position. If there is no mutual respect, why should I get the worst of both worlds and have to respect yours while you completely disrespect mine? Because I'm totally on board. I do not have an issue with people making English ethno parties to try and push the interests that they think they have there. I personally don't think I'd join that party or personally support it, but I do think it's completely fair to do that while we have entire parties and entire groups in parties pushing for those exact things for ethnicities outside of the English ethnicity, the Welsh ethnicity, the Scottish ethnicity. Because I know you've got the SNP, Implied Cymru, and other quote-unquote nationalist parties, but even they're not really pushing for the Welsh well, the ethnic Welsh or the ethnic Scots, because they're pushing for open borders and constantly saying diversity is our strength and all this. I mean, Plaid Cymru were completely on board with Mark Drakeford's idea of moving Black History Month to Black History Year because COVID ruined Black History Month. Like, how can we have all these institutions pushing for foreign ethnicities and not have ones for native ethnicities? It doesn't make any sense. Either all of them are okay or none of them are okay. You've got to make your mind up. Because you can't just respect certain ones, and you, especially when it's a case of only respecting foreign ones and completely ignoring native ones. You know, if you don't show any respect for my history, 
I don't see why I should pretend to respect yours. Again, and same case, but on historic grounds, we absolutely learn nothing of English history, frankly. We learn the Tudors, we learn a bit of the Stuarts, but then you just seem to skip to World War One and Two, and that seems really consistent with everyone I talk to. And e- even if we did touch upon parts of the Empire or any dates between 1560 and 1914, all that got mentioned from what I remember is slavery, and all that was mentioned there was we were part of the slave trade. Nothing about how we got rid of it, nothing about the national pride behind abolishing it, nothing about the debt that was racked up to free the slaves that then took about 200 years to pay off. None of that history is respected. All we care about is the Tudors because everyone needs to know that Henry VIII had six wives. And then even when it comes to his sons and daughters, I've read in Robert Toombs's The English and Their History that when things like the Civil War and Henry VIII's children are taught in schools, religion is barely brought up as a massive divide in the country between who preferred which king and who went on which side, despite the fact it was the pinnacle reason for all the political turmoil from Henry VIII till after the Civil War. I mean, sure, there were other reasons, such as the divine right of kings, should Charles I be an absolute monarch, things like this. But really, when it came to people picking sides, it was basically entirely down to the religion. If you were Catholic, you were a royalist. If you were a Protestant, you were a roundhead. But that history is so disrespected that now they feel they have to take even more of the English history away so that all these foreigners can have whatever history that the pressure groups are trying to put in for them, such as slavery or how Britain quote-unquote robbed resources from India, which basically the only paper written on that that anyone ever cites is by a Marxist. So given it's about economics, I can just throw that away because Marxist and economics do not mix. They get things wrong. But this is the world we live in, and I'm absolutely on Douglas Murray's side. Why should I respect your history when you're literally trying to take away the education of mine? You're clearly not respecting mine. I'm not going to respect yours. Just be a chad. Say no. Uh, If you don't respect my culture, I don't need to respect yours. Yeah, another one. Just same example with culture. It's constantly talked about how we live in a multicultural society and all cultures need to be respected. And so, well, there does seem to be respect for... Almost all, apart from, of course, the native one. And whenever there is a native day of celebration, such as VE Day or Bonfire Night, you can expect a lot of panel shows and a lot of articles from The Guardian about how it's actually rooted in racism, white supremacy, things like that. So screw it, why would we stand for it anymore? That is my question. If you don't respect me, I see no reason to respect you. Now that one is a hell of a lot more personal. But I completely agree. Why, when you are not given the benefit of the doubt, why, when people make horrible assumptions about you, why should you not pay the same in return? And one side of me is, of course, shouting at me saying, do the Christian thing, turn the other cheek, etc, etc. But you can't do that forever. You only have so many cheeks. At some point, you've got to realise that they realise that they have power over you. You say one thing wrong, it can end up in a non-crime hate instant, it can go on your permanent record and it can stop you getting certain jobs. That That's just the reality. The Equalities Act and other laws are all completely one-sided. It'll be worth probably going into a Freedom of Information Act to see exactly how many hate crime, non-crime hate instances, sorry, have been filed by straight white men because they felt that their straight white maleness was under attack in some way. And I'd be surprised if the number is, well, above zero. And so, if you're not per- being personally respected by someone, yeah, don't don't offer the same respect back. Especially if it's in politics, and especially if you're being accused of things that you're not. If someone calls me a racist, or if someone calls me a sexist, or anything like that, I tend to just ignore them now, or troll them. Because I know the conversation can't go anywhere. Um, now, what does this look like, this lack of politeness? Well, it would look like telling some truths that our ear has been too polite not to uh, say, or to, in recent years at any rate. Oh, God, I wonder if he's going to bring up the FBI crime statistics. <laughs> that would be spicy. In, in the end of his series on civilization, Lord Clark memorably said that, um, that, uh, that, that courtesy was one of the things that defined the West. It's a very interesting thing to fall on at the end of his thing, but courtesy. Courtesy is a hugely important thing in Western society. 
but it's not endless. I think especially when it comes to the British way of life, that is especially true. We have been a very, very civil, generally, and even very fair in terms of under the law, by common law, in terms of rule-based and rule-of-law-based society. The British, and especially the English, are very much on board with the idea of justice. You do something wrong to damage the fabric of society by committing a crime, you know, stealing from someone, murdering someone, whatever. You deserve punishment that is proportional. So, in the old days, if you murdered someone, you got murdered yourself. Alright, if you did it by accident, if there were caveats here, if it was something unavoidable, okay, we'll take that into consideration. You won't get the death penalty, but you will be put away for a long time. If you steal, you can get fined. Going back even further, every man has a duty to help defend the country, so you need to learn how to use a longbow. So on your day off, you need to go off to the range and practice for an hour. And if you don't do that, you're not doing your part and you get punished. And obviously this has all been developed over time. And really it's around the world wars where this goes nuts. And it's less of you have a duty to the country and the government. And now it's, oh, well, the government and public expenditure should now make life as easy as possible for you, which was never the point. The point was you don't get in each other's way too much. The law and the government is just there to protect the borders and protect your rights your natural rights, as written by John Locke. Because of Carl from the Lotus Seat has been saying for quite some time, basically all English common law was, it, it was just a rediscovering of the rights that England had before the time of kings. You, you had natural rights. You can speak freely, you are free to go about your business as long as it doesn't interfere with anyone else's, you know, too much. And John Locke basically wrote that all down in his two treatises of government and then obviously it was codified in the Bill of Rights 1689 and we even had gun rights at that point. As long as you didn't kill anyone, why shouldn't you be able to own a gun? Whereas the post-war consensus seems to be, oh, look how well we did in the war, well why don't we just carry that on but in the economy? And it doesn't work that way. If you want the economy to run well, it needs to be more laissez-faire and the government needs to get out of the way, as it did in Victorian England. And over the Victorian period, you saw the biggest improvement to a country probably ever and all issues were effectively foreign because of this massive empire and even in the empire we were very courteous when we went through india we realized that there was a massive uh, cultural phenomenon of burning wives after the husband died so we put a stop to that brought in the rule of law to a lot of places obviously there were major mismanagement issues i'll call them that is natural to come along with wars in south africa say but overall the modern world that we've got out of the biggest empire of the past few centuries, yeah, we've done pretty well, and most of the world is pretty courteous because of our culture, and it's been influenced by our culture that we exported. But now, just by mass immigration, foreign cultures, as, you know, everyone's saying we live in a multi society, everyone's exporting their cultures to us, and they don't generally seem to be as courteous. So why would we return the favour? especially when they're in our country, our courteous country, if you will, we have a limit. It really depends when we reach that limit. So here would be an, a non-courteous thing to say. Um, we t we've been told about other ways of knowing, um, other ways of doing maths, non-race, anti-racist science, and all this sort of thing. Yet we do not go to any Aboriginal communities for vaccines. It's not quite the FBI crime statistics, but, you know, it's still a pretty spicy topic. But yes, he is correct. Effectively, most of the world relies on the West to function. Because if the West doesn't exist, they have absolutely nothing to export. We go to no first peoples for cancer treatment. We go to them for no mathematical, scientific or artistic discoveries. We do not go to them to rediscover other languages and other cultures. Partly, largely, because such communities seem to have had not much interest in other cultures. Unlike the Western mind, they seem not to have taken a great interest. Yeah, basically the West seems to be the perfect place to make innovations, discoveries, scientific, technological progress, artistic progress, though obviously in recent years, maybe not so much that. But also a main thing to point out there, the Westerners, and especially England, again, with the British Museum, seem to be very good at preserving history and artefacts and cultures, basically. And it's probably a good job we did that, because a lot of the Middle East, 
under ISIS and other regimes, seem to like to go very iconoclastic. Well, the thing with Edmund Burke, who was a huge inspiration to British culture and especially conservatism, points out that society isn't just for the people living now. It is for all the generations before, plus all the generations after, and we just happen to be here along the timeline. So it should be up to us to preserve what is good and carefully decide what isn't worth having anymore. It's a common courtesy for the future generations and the generations of the past. Though, as Douglas Murray says, we don't appear to go out and try and make discoveries to bring here for whatever reason. But what we have done, which I think is a bit of a shame, is open the floodgates for mass migration. And now because of that, a lot of politicians, a lot of pressure groups are saying we have to completely change the way society has run and developed over the past millennia, even more than a millennia in fact, and turn it into this mess of laws, institutions and pressure groups that can never seem to actually decide on even what truth is. I mean, look, there's a reason that with the current Tory leadership contest going on that one of the leaders has come into question because she can't even define what a woman is and then she had to do a massive cope and say, oh no, I do know what a woman is at their campaign launch. It's because it's a mess. We've taken courtesy and tolerance way too far. We need to tell people, no, that's not true. No, that is bad. No, that is destroying my area. This town doesn't feel like home anymore. You know, ask the question and let people know why there seems to be such a movement of white native people moving out of cities such as London and moving to the shires. And then even that action's called racist and people are like, why are the shires so racist? Just, there needs to be a point where enough is enough and immigration numbers are brought right down. Even though obviously that's not the only issue, but it seems to be a good start. The not courteous thing would be us saying, we've been courteous for an awfully long time and we're going to stop because it seems not to be doing us much good. I mean, where's the lie? I've just gone through many different types of things. It seems to be worsening education. It's certainly worsening the standard of the native male population. They are at the bottom pretty consistently of most league tables for how where they're attaining in school. Old classics such as Dad's Army, Monty Python, things like that, they're, they're being called... They're basically being called racist and misogynistic pieces of art by potential leaders of the Tory party, of all things. Everything just seems to be lurching towards globalisation and anything that is deemed British, it can only be this kind of coverall. It's, uh, oh, you drape things in the British flag on VE Day or during the Jubilee, when really those things should be happening every day. And there are quite a few villages that I pass through and I do see quite a lot of British flags. I've actually been seeing quite a rise in the Union Jack being waved in, at the front of houses these days, even though we're way beyond the Jubilee. So there does seem to be a resurgence of that basic instinct to show your colours. And I think that might be the start of a kind of snap of saying, look, stop saying that my flag is racist and that it's a butcher's apron. It's my flag in my country, I am going to fly it. And you never know, that could be the small end of the wedge for not being courteous. But anyway, let's hear what Michael Walker has to say about this, because obviously he's going to be a moron about it. We've been too courteous as the West to Aboriginals and First Nation people. We literally subjected them to genocide. See, so already it's, it's, it's stupid, and he's just not listened to what Douglas Murray had to say. We've been too courteous in that, say, in Canada, when it came to natives there, because of a few schools where there hasn't even been proof that anything bad was done to the children, in that they were mass murdered, basically. Just finding unmarked graves of a number of children, I can't remember exactly how many, they started going around destroying statues and they started burning down Catholic churches. And basically nothing, no one has been criminally charged for that as far as I'm aware. If there are any Canadians out there that know any examples of someone being charged for that, please let me know. But I'd say that's being beyond courteous. Oh yeah, there might have been a genocide. There's no proof at the moment and we're not actually sure, but go ahead, burn down this property of the Catholic Church, tear down these public statues. I mean, in Britain, for example, the whole Colston case, those kids, well, they're not even kids, I've really got to stop doing that. Those 20-odd-year-olds who tore down the statue because of some vague accusation that he was in the slave trade, none of them can actually tell you the details of this, they'll just say he's a slave trader, which he wasn't, he just had shares in the Royal Africa Company, and obviously one of the commodities of having shares over a 
company that spans the Atlantic. That's obviously going to involve some slave trade, but no one can tell you how much, no one can tell you how much money he made for it. Nothing from that. It's just there's a vague accusation that he was doing completely legal things. Yeah, he's just allowed to tear down the statue because it's deemed obscene by the jury. It's things like that that are being overly courteous. And so, speaking specifically of England and Britain, when it comes to the slave trade, which is the only real massive thing that you can even call close to a genocide, even though it absolutely wasn't, we were trying to keep them alive... We're just going to ignore the entire history of the abolition movement, of the massive debt the country went into to free the slaves, of the massive operation to patrol West Africa to capture any ships with slaves on to make it impossible for every other empire. I mean, I think that's, again, I think that's going beyond courteous, but that is something I completely support. But no, oh, we did these bad things. We have to forever f self flagellate. Why? <laughs> Why do we need to do that? It's, it's this strange thing as well of constantly saying we. No one alive today actually had anything to do with the slave trade. And everyone alive today, especially in the UK and Britain, they have only benefited because of our involvement in the slave trade. And is there any courtesy from that? Any thanks? No, they're all in Sierra Leone saying, oh, by the way, we've got this big old arch that's thanking the British for their philanthropy for freeing us. We're really appreciative of the Brits. But now, you know... Pressure groups over here for black nationalists. No, they have to constantly say we're just a racist country. Great. You've done well there, Mike. You've done absolutely nothing to learn or understand what Douglas Murray is saying. And it's going to be your downfall. Right. Genocide. And now there's a few university courses in American universities, which means that Douglas Murray now suddenly thinks we're the victims. This is another point that leftists always do. And it's a, it's a really weird concession because they are here conceding that, oh... Yeah, Douglas Murray has pointed out a problem that basically university courses are turning people anti-white racists and, you know, anti-male misandrists or whatever. They'll admit that's happening, but they'll say that, oh, it's really small and it's actually not a big problem. So it's really weird that they'll say they're university courses and then what those university courses are teaching, they're clearly directly leading to policy and pressure groups and activism that's just huge throughout the US. And also the UK, because the TERFs and the trans radical activists have been going to war in the streets, essentially, in Britain recently. So they'll admit that they understand that the problem stems from there, or that at least the right-wingers are pointing to something tangible. But then when, <laughs> basically, when the right-wingers show them the pipeline, that's a hell of a lot better evidence than anything said about the YouTube pipelines. Then they just downplay it. They'll, they'll pretend that these things that were happening in the 70s, the big march through the institutions which are starting back then, they'll pretend they're still at that point. When I don't know what else you need to show them to say, look, there is clearly a massive undermining of Western values in every country in the West, in the US, in France, in the UK, and people are quite clearly seeing the problem. And even then, if it is just in universities, why don't you then talk about the university courses? They play it down like they don't even need to talk about it. Of course, I know the answer. It's because these are dishonest hacks who would just quite frankly be demolished if they ever had a conversation with Douglas Murray. But honestly, I'd pay to watch that. Aaron, there's a lot to say about that clip. I want to throw to you. What has he got wrong there? Oh, that's it. That's all Michael Walker has to say on it. I mean, I mean this is the thing. Why can they just say, oh, this undermining of the West? Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a few... Um, it's a few course in university it's nothing to worry about and so the non-courteous reply would just be oh yeah there were just a few genocides a few centuries ago who cares like i've unironically said that to people and it is actually my position literally you just need to get over these genocides you're not going to get reparations for them now any reparations you would get your ancestors got i'm sorry we're way too beyond the pale to actually make any useful reparations and work it out in any meaningful way you'd just be getting free money for something that that frankly doesn't affect you. But Mike here doesn't seem to understand that that's the basic reply and that's the basic thing that Douglas Murray's getting at. If you're going to downplay all the problems that we're bringing forward, we're just going to downplay the ones that you're bringing forward too. And the thing is, is that this is why I moved right wing. It seems the right wing seems to be on the right side of these problems and these issues. Well, he's got everything wrong, Michael. And the thing is, he says so much nonsense with such confidence. You know, the idea that, oh, there are other ways of doing mathematics. Of course there are other ways of doing mathematics. Interesting. Why have we been using the same type of mathematics for theoretical physics, for building bridges, for engineering, even for economics and statistics? Why have we been using the... <laughs> Why have we been using Pythagoras' theorem for millennia? Why is every piece of development in mathematics 
derived from the way that mathematics has always been done. Can you even give me an example of another way to do Pythagoras' theorem, another way to find the area of a circle, another way basic addition, multiplication and all this, and another way all that's done, Aaron? Or are you just being a moron and have to go completely contrary to Douglas Murray because you have no idea what he was actually saying? There are ways of doing mathematics we don't yet understand or comprehend. That's how scientific knowledge works. It's contingent. Yes, and there'll only be one way to do these things. Just because something is undiscovered, it, it, that's not what Douglas Murray is saying. He's not saying we have discovered everything in science, maths, etc., and that there is no point going on or looking for it elsewhere. He's saying whenever discoveries are made, they are typically done in developed Western nations. I mean, just look at this list of inventions by countries. Austro-Hungary, remote controller, transistor, Netherlands invaded eight things, including the CD. Czech Republic, they, they made the contact lenses. I didn't even know that. France made the pressure cooker, hot air balloon, parachute, photography. Russia making, well, similar things, radios, tube TVs, helicopters. Netherlands, I've mentioned. And then rest of the world, Canada, Western country, China, three things, pay for money, firearms, navigational compass, Japan making another CD-ROM and mini-disc. Well, the way inventions work is that quite a lot of people actually invent it all at once in slightly different ways. And then obviously we've got some US inventions there, telegraph, refrigerator, things like that. Sweden make a couple with dynamite, obviously, and astronomical lenses. We go further down. Switzerland made the wristwatch and the cuckoo clock. Germany, clarinet, pocket watch, microphone, automobile, i.e. the car. Obviously the UK will have had a place in that as well. Again, it's the way inventions work, but you know, 23 inventions by the UK, 28 by the US, 18 by Germany, Italy as well at the bottom made some. There's a lot of inventions done by the Western world and even outside of Europe, they're still Western or at least Westernized countries that happen to be very developed at the times of those inventions. And it's not like any Western country or individual hid this from anyone else, apart from obviously drawing wars where it would make sense. But no, in peaceful times, these inventions would be commercialized and sold on the world market. You know, this would be shared with the world and eventually it would make it to lesser developed countries and countries outside of the West. Hence you see 21st century infrastructure being pushed into all these less economically developed countries helping with their infrastructure because it's mutually beneficial to everyone involved. Yet as Douglas Murray mentions, you don't see Britain, US going out to Africa and asking local scientists there, hey what innovations have you made? Instead they will come over to our great institutions and try and help with the discoveries here. But of course Bastani is just going to completely ignore that and call him a racist. It's contingent until the next discovery, the next innovation. That's that's literally how knowledge works. It's contingent. Yes, uh, and as mentioned before, why are all the scientists coming to our institutions rather than anyone from the economically developed places going out there? Unless it's to do field work. By virtue of the scientific method. So he doesn't have the slightest clue what he's talking about. Oh, the West, it's, it's dependent on politeness and courtesy. Really? Japanese culture isn't courteous? Japanese is westernized, although it did have a massive honor culture back in the day before World War II. But not even that, it, it, Douglas Murray isn't saying that exclusively the West is courteous, this is another thing that people don't get. Whenever I'm asked to define Britishness and I say, oh, civility is an example, they'll be like, oh, so nowhere else is civil? Which is completely besides the point, we're all human, we've all developed cultures. Of course, some cultures, especially those near each other, are going to develop similar aspects. So it's just a stupid point for Douglas Murray to say, oh, the West is built on courteousness and it's been too courteous for too long. And then when you go, oh my god, are you saying Japan isn't courteous? What the hell? It's just a stupid thing to say. It's not addressing the point. Or Persian culture, there's a word in Farsi, taruf, it being, you know, excessively courteous. The same point is just not addressing anything Douglas Murray's saying. Douglas Murray never said that it's the West that is exclusively courteous. He hasn't got the slightest idea what he's talking about. He plays the faux anthropologist, but then doesn't actually understand that this very same concept exists in most cultures. The idea it only permeates the West is, is utterly ridiculous. Yes, but this is the difference here. Douglas Murray has said that the way you look at... I, I mean, I don't like the fact it says Western history because I think Western cultures are all too different to really be put under one big umbrella. 
but I put that at fault to the universities for putting Europe under one big umbrella for so long. But as Lord Clark said, one of the biggest defining aspects of the Western civilization was courtesy. That doesn't mean exclusively the West is courteous, that doesn't mean courtesy only exists in the West. What it means is there is a huge emphasis on it. It is seen as one of the largest virtues. That doesn't mean that it is not the largest virtue of anywhere else. That doesn't mean it's the only place where courtesy exists. It just means through the historical timeline of civilization, courtesy has been a big value in the West. And it is true, and it appears to be making it so that it is easily undermined. That's what Douglas Murray is saying, and he is saying that we need to be careful about who we are courteous to, because if they are not reciprocal in that courtesy, then something needs to be done about that. That is all he's saying. But Aaron Bastan is a moron, so can't see that. And I think it's problematic for all of us that he's doing this in the United States, because there's nothing more certain than a thick Englishman speaking with a posh accent, doing very well and finding a very receptive audience the other side of the Atlantic. There's a thing that a lot of YouTubers say and they think Carl puts on a posh accent f so that people think he's smarter when, no, he just has an average English accent. But he's essentially saying here that he thinks Douglas Murray's a grifter and that the reason that he's able to grift better over in the US is because he's got a posh English accent. And he also seems to be implying that he's putting it on, which he isn't, that's just how Douglas Murray talks. It, but it's what a lot of leftists do when they've run out of things to actually attack. Because they had nothing to attack in that clip. That's why Bastani has gone straight to calling him a grifter. It's a great shame for the rest of us. And the way that he talks about this, you know, it's like he's talking about a toxic ex-girlfriend or ex-boyfriend. Well, we've had enough of this, you know. We've, this is just, quite frankly, ridiculous. Well, I'm not being funny, but when you've let quite a lot of people into the country who are clearly not native and then pressure groups are developed and institutions are taken over to completely undermine everything that the civilization has been built for yeah you'd be pretty annoyed about it hence there's a whole culture war happening because there's a massive push to undermine as douglas murray says western values as i'd say british values and britishness but then as soon as you say that you'll get idiots saying oh do you mean white people and at that point there's no point having the conversation because there's clearly no goodwill there from the opponent Hence, yes, after quite some time of that, people do get rather annoyed and are fed up with being courteous. Our numbers are Arabic. Oh, for Christ's sake. Mine astronomy had the calendar down better than the Julian calendar, which we used until the 16th century. Again, it's, it's very strange. Douglas Murray was clearly talking about modern things such as medicine. Why do you think he mentioned vaccines? Like, you've got to understand, all right, yeah, the, the Arabics were better at maths and further civilised than the English, let's say. If you think a load of Englishmen went over to Arabia and the kingdoms where all these developments were being made, started to make pressure groups to undermine the whole thing, do you reckon the Arabian kingdoms would be happy about that? Do you reckon they'd be courteous? Or do you reckon they'd just behead them like they did in the Crusades? Indian and Arabic mathematics are just as core to mathematics today as anything done by a European. Yes, Douglas Murray would agree with that. He's not saying that absolutely everything ever has been developed in the West. He's saying in the modern world, that is where it is all being done at the moment. And that there are constant attempts to try and undermine it. Stop being an idiot. Listen. What the hell is this man talking about? Well, at least he finally admits that he doesn't understand what's being said. So I'll take that. And the confidence to speak such utter garbage as well. His ignorance is only matched by his phony assuredness. See, absolutely no argument to attack goes into calling him a grifter, specifically the type that has a posh English accent and goes over there to try and seem intelligent. Despite the fact that I've read both Murray and Aaron Bastani, and I can tell you, I mean, you've probably assumed this anyway, but Douglas Murray's books are a lot more thoughtful, a lot more well-cited, and they appear to understand everything, just every single topic better. That comes from a place actually, I think often of actually not being certain, of actually lacking confidence. You know, the scientific method is being open to new perspectives and new ideas. This man is the opposite of the scientific method. Well, this is just hilarious because this is, this is another thing that Carl and Adam Frenard have been going on about for some time. Because at the moment we're talking about values, we're talking about Western values in terms of Douglas Murray, I personally talk about British values. And when it comes to the scientific method, that's got nothing to do with cultural values. Science is little more than a tool. 
and Aaron Bastani finally said something correct in that it needs to constantly be questioned, though I think if you asked Aaron Bastani should the COVID science be questioned, he'd probably say no. And that's actually another point. He says, oh, Arabic and Indian maths is as core to mathematics as anything developed in the West. Yes, Western mathematics is developed off... I don't even know what Indian mathematics you base it off, but Arabic mathematics, yes, and Greek with Pythagoras. Uh, the thing is, is that Murray's clearly talking about modern discoveries, which, as shown by the inventions list, are basically all done in the West, with some done in Japan and some done in China, and there's probably some done in Korea as well. These very, very developed nations that give you ample opportunity to make innovations, though not so much in China these days, given their inventions date back to the 14th century and probably before. But everything that Douglas Murray has said there has... It doesn't really have much to do with the scientific method. It doesn't have anything to do with it. He's just saying Western values are being undermined and part of the attack on Western values is to attack anything developed in Europe. Call it imperialistic, call it white supremacist. You know, the, the Protestant work ethic, that's been deemed white supremacy and that being on time for anything is whiteness. And all right, fair enough, you can say that Douglas Murray didn't make that clear or didn't bring up those examples. But he's trying to sell his book. He's giving you the broad idea of what it's talking about. You can probably find these examples in the book, but I'd hardly believe that you are going to read it and try and critique it in any way. I, but there you go. I mean, the title says that he went full fash. Though they actually didn't mention in what way that was fascist at all. They just went on to say, oh, we genocided. We meaning, of course. It doesn't even mean people who colonised, because not all colonies were genocidal. Especially the British ones. And then went on to say that he doesn't understand the scientific method, even though he, again, didn't really talk about the scientific method. He was just talking about values, which is separate to the scientific method. There are different ways of developing moral and values and culture. It's not done in a scientific way. You can explain it and research it in a scientific way, but it is not developed by science. And in fact, trying to, to develop it using a scientific method, not going to work. We are too irrational a being to have any sort of rigid structure for development. So, in summary, Navarro Media, as usual, are being idiots. Douglas Murray says something perfectly poignant and perfectly reasonable. Socialists go absolutely nuts about it. But I'd love to know how he was being fascist there, because they just didn't give any explanation. They literally just called Douglas Murray a fascist in the title and then make a crap five-minute video like that, where they don't say anything, apart from call them an idiot and a grifter. And these idiots will still get book deals and still get on panels on the BBC. It's insane how this country's run, and how they constantly undermine it, and then constantly claim that they're not. But anyway, that's everything I had for you today, so as usual, thank you very much for watching, and until next time, goodbye.